What's up, everyone? Welcome to another Market Radar podcast. Let's start it off with a quick little recap of some events from this past week. We did see jobless claims come in 5,000 over consensus, coming in at 245K, uh, which was a surprise. Uh, We'll have to see how that progresses. Could this be the start of um, unemployment ticking up? We shall see. This is what the Fed is looking at for cutting. Obviously, we don't think they're going to be cutting anytime soon, but anything's possible. Next, we had the Philly Fed Manufacturing Index coming in below consensus. And then we did have PMI coming in at the highest since Jan 2022. So that was also a surprise. Growth is keeping up and our model is hinting at growth. Not, It's not doing good, but it's really not shitting the bed. So it, it, we're, we're very much in a gray area right now where... Uh, We kind of have the battle between growth and inflation, both being very stagnant, um, no clear direction being shown by the market so far. So next week, uh, we've got um, not much going on other than GDP on Thursday. That's going to be the main thing we will be looking for. Other than that, uh, it's not going to be too heavy of a week in terms of Uh, events going on. Let's take a look at what the NASDAQ did this past week, though. Uh, Again, also not much going on uh, in equities and bonds. Uh, It was a very slow and stagnant week, which it's not a bad thing. We're seeing volatility really die off now. And some are seeing that as an opportunity. You know, something's going to happen. There's a black swan coming up, um, long volatility. Uh, that's not really the case. Lower volatility, it's it's a good sign. It means things are being repaired. Um, so anything else you have to add, Gamma? Yeah, so um, in terms of volatility, we'll hop right into VIX real quick. What um, what you're saying is is exactly what a lot of people are thinking in terms of black swan, the market, you know, you get you get the typical the the VIX is broken bunch of nonsense. Um, and reality, what is going on here is the market is slowing down in terms of um, momentum. In turn, then volatility will compress. And that's what we're seeing. And um, specifically, that short-term chop momentum we've been seeing, this is, again, very bullish to see in markets. You, If you're a bull, you want to see this. If you're a bear, this does not make you happy. Hence, a lot of perma bears getting very triggered. Yeah, based they're, on they're using this prices. as an excuse to oh, now's the time to long volatility. Something's going to happen because volatility is so low. Right. It's completely and, backwards. Yeah. And um, another thing that I've been saying on 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 VIX specifically on Twitter is that the key now um, is going to be, do we hold a pop up? Do we hold a rip? Meaning, as you can see here, the white line is mid vamp, which is the middle between upper and lower vamp. If uh, and since we do hold below it, price continues to basically short term price action is lower as we hold below it. Anything, um, anything remotely bullish is going to require us or anything bullish volatility is going to is going to require VIX to get above that mid vamp and start spiking. So um, you can almost think of it in two stages, right? If you are unsure of what's going to happen in the market and you're not you're not sure is this the start of the, another a bull run in in equities um you're going to need to see these two things happen um you're going to get a vix pop at some point vix is not going to just stay at 16 forever uh, or lower um you're going to get some type of reverse reversal off uh, especially after getting crushed like this rather aggressively right you're coming from vix 30 all the way down to vix vix in the 15s at one point so Step one is going to take out is going to be taking out mid vamp, which is currently 1787. You would start breaking up uh, or start ripping up. Now, the important part to watch thereafter is going to be: Do we make a lower high within um, this downtrend? Now that we have this this bearish trend here, so meaning once VIX gets above mid vamp, can we hold above 20 uh, below? Excuse me, 2284. That will be the key for the bulls. If they if VIX can do that. It'll show you that the market really has no desire to run away with volatility and a lot of the fear is blown out. So if you're unsure of what's going to happen, we're very likely going to get a VIX pop at some point, given the dramatic 
rip down that or dramatic sinking in price that we've been seeing here. Um, watch to see if that pop holds. If that pop holds and we can get above 2284, then things become rather problematic for equities. If we don't, um, you're going to see a lot of triggered perma bears. Yeah. And speaking of triggered perma bears, let's go into gold. We uh, we are seeing a lot of perma gold talk going on. Um, but as we've been saying, we, we do have podcasts on this. You need real yields to move lower for gold to continue this push higher. And we have been seeing real yields reversing, continuing um, reversing course going upwards, which has been putting some downward pressure on gold. Um, but why why did real yields reverse? So remember, real yields are a composition of nominals and break evens, and I have them displayed on the bottom here. Nominal being uh, nominals, excuse me, being in blue, and break evens being in orange. Now, what this represents, real yields, is the difference between the two: nominals minus break evens. If we scroll out, you'll notice that break evens were above nominals for a period of time here in 2020 to 2022, when when the uh, positions reversed. This time period was a period of negative real yields, meaning if you bought a tre- if you bought a treasury bond at this point, the anticipation of you making money was negative. You were actually losing because the expected inflation rate over the duration of which the break evens measure, in this case, 10 years, was higher than the actual rate on the bond. Now, what's also very interesting is break evens are much more attentive in terms of pricing in inflation because they're market price forwards, right? They're expecting, they're pricing in the expected inflation rate over the next 10 years. So the Fed has less of, of a hold on break evens than they do nominals because, again, the nominals are, are yields on a treasury bond, right? The break evens are the expected inflation rate over duration based off of treasury, inflated, uh, treasury inflation. Um, protection securities, the tips. So some can argue the Fed has been in the tips market. They've been basically muddling around in there and and, um, controlling it to a degree, but it's nothing like how it's not controlled nearly as much as nominals are, which is why you saw, if we look close here, after 2020, break-evens were able to accelerate at a very, very decent rate while Treasuries were nominals, I should say, were stuck rather low. And this was, again, break-evens were picking up inflationary pressure, while nominals were not moving because the Fed was not moving. Yeah, And this created well, so the negative... What's what's happening now? What's causing the move that we're seeing now? So right now we're seeing nominals come up a bit. For the, it's, not, it's not drastic. Real yields aren't up that much. Um, so it's not that we're seeing real yields breaking out, meaning nominals, uh, the spread between nominals and break evens are really accelerating. But break evens have been in a rather down. Break evens peaked in April of 2022 on the 10 year, meaning 10 year expect for uh, 10 year uh, inflation expectations. Based what, what that's telling you is the inflation expectations over the next 10 years is nowhere near where it was in April of 2022. And it's 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 been going down and chopping sideways. So. Um, the fear of longer term inflation in the markets is not that severe. We are still up greatly from the 2020 or 2020, 2018 to 2020, uh, 2019, excuse me, 2018, 2019 area, but um, we're not up as much as we were back in early 2022. So, what's going on right now is gold, again, so I said this on Twitter as well this week. If you don't know how to classify gold, the best way to classify it is a long duration, zero coupon bond, right? So it doesn't pay a dividend. It it doesn't pay a coupon, excuse me. There's no dividend. Um, And it's the longest duration possible, meaning um, you're betting that that real yields will drop with gold. So gold's a long duration asset, right? Um, As real yields fall, gold price will go up. The only difference between gold and bonds, they're actually very similar, but the only real difference is gold has no default risk, meaning it's not a treasury that a debt ceiling could hinder the the profit of the um the quality of or the or the um I should say the the repayment ability, right? Because gold's a physical asset. So um in terms of 
in terms of how we price these things going forward or how gold's pricing this whole debt ceiling debacle, we'll get into that in a little bit on what's going on. Gold is picking up basically this idea that the US could default. Now, what that means is gold is pricing in a possibility where what happens if treasury if there's a de- if there's a whole default fiasco gold's going to have a premium right because again it's that zero default security there's there's no default to it you can't default so gold got this immense bid starting in november as the debt ceiling um issue started picking up and real yields peaked um just about then as well so real yields going down is bullish for gold um over the long term there's a strong correlation between um Real yield, specifically 10 years and further in duration, and gold and bonds. They move rather um, in synchronous, except recently in 2020, to 20, in this recent era uh, regime of higher real yields, uh, there's a lot of things that actually prevented gold from getting smoked as much as bonds, and some of it being the global war premiums. Um, if it's other central banks under stress, people demanding gold, it really did not fall as much as even I would have expected it to, but it didn't go anywhere else. So um, we're, we weren't short it, but we also are not long gold at this point in time because, again, we need real yields to go lower. Now, what's going to happen here, what has happened here is you had this whole bait and switch, basically. Everyone's all geared up into gold. This is the time for a gold bug to shine, right? Central banks are, uh, you know, you're, you're out here defending yourself against this, the incompetence of central banks. Um, central banks may be screwed. Governments may default. This is the time that gold should excel. Reason it's not, and, and reason you saw this huge pump in it is the expectations that re- that the government would have to cut rates and and basically stimulate the shit out of the economy uh, because we were going into a recession, if not a depression. Um, and that's and, that's not happening. And right. So de- deflation doesn't look like it's coming. So not, not not yet. Yeah. That, so that people really are just, caught off guard. Yeah, it's blindsided yeah. everyone. Right. So now the now what they're going to need to see here is they're going to need to see real yields uh to get the gold trade moving. Now a lot you can make this other argument, right? To my point. Yeah, um gold is traded like shit and so have bonds, but bonds have been much worse. Meaning if you're a gold bug and you're just long gold, you haven't felt much pain here. And that's even though real yields have rise, which I think you you had the perfect storm. Um, realistically, you should have gotten pretty beaten up in gold. And at some at one point you were down quite a bit. Um, but it's it's reversed rather well. Um, which is which is good if you're a long-term gold bug, you know, for for your sake of not being so much underwater from from peak uh from peak value over here in 20 in early 2022 uh, or, tw- or even 2020. The downside is though that you're not gonna get that gold continuation trade until real yields break the trend lower. Meaning this chop that we've been seeing here is most likely going to continue as long as real yields aren't in down aren't moving in in bearish with bearish momentum. And Until so, that happens, so what would need to happen to get a lower real yield? Okay, so let's look at the the composition of real yields. You'll have to have one of two things happen: nominals would have to come down, or break evens would have to go up. And we know that break evens probably are at least right now, based on what we can see in the market and what the market's pricing, real yields don't look like they're going to start breaking out and running. We we need another inflation problem for that yeah. to happen, right? Uh, but you would also need the Fed to not be hiking into that inflation problem, which doesn't seem really realistic, to be honest. Right? Meaning they they would we, be hiking as soon as they are seeing inflation becoming a problem again, or or, or at least shortly thereafter, which would keep really the, the spread between real yields wide preventing that gold rally. Really what you want to see to get this gold rally going is you're going to want to see nominals come down. You're going to want to see this gap close. And realistically, um, that's going to happen only really when the Fed starts cutting rates or we get a recession, which is one and the same technically. And break-evens will go down too. But the, the, the whole thing is the Fed is going to be able to drag 10 year the, the nominals down faster than the break-evens can fall, like you, like you, see, like you see here. Or you see in any other real, um, real yield, I should say, a negative or bearish real yield environment, nominals fall faster. That that gap closes faster, basically, because nominal the gap closes because basically nominals are falling faster than break evens because the Fed's cutting rates. So until we see the Fed really um, even start 
talking about cutting rates, it's not going to be something that I think we're we're going to we're going to have to um, worry about right now. Or I guess the only other way that you could look at this is gold will emerge rather quickly and swiftly, and nominals will start breaking down if a recession comes out of, uh, out of nowhere and blindsides everyone. Obviously, then the Fed's going to just have to be for, going to have to force um, rate, uh, or enact force rate cuts where the market isn't expecting it. Right. And but that pretty much sums up the real yield situation in gold and why gold is not. You know, a lot of people want to know why gold is not printing new all-time highs or new. Excuse me, new um, multi-year highs here. Um, I, I believe there, they'd be all-time highs as well, actually. So that's your that's your reason. Real yields need to um, real yields need to contract more than what they've they've already done. Um, otherwise, it is going to be just chop. Yeah. Um, but let's let's go into Bitcoin here. So Bitcoin's down rather aggressively this week. It's down ten percent. Um, it's been bullish trend since mid mid to late January, so it's seen a rather good run so far. And the reason I bring up Bitcoin is number one, this is a risk on asset. So this being bullish trend inherently is going to be good for equities, regardless of where the system stands. This this alone is a good sign if you're a bull in the markets. Um, number two, I bring this up is we are going to drop our Astrius model. Um, in the daily reports. And what that is, is it's basically Aries for crypto. And what it does, I'm going to bring it up right here. What it does is it, is it trades Bitcoin. This is a Bitcoin only model, long only. There's no shorting. It'll only long Bitcoin during risk on regimes and bullish trends, uh, Bitcoin bullish trends. Meaning if Bitcoin is not bullish trend, it won't long. And if the regime is not risk on, it won't be long Bitcoin. And as you can see, um, we only go back to early to or late to early 2017 because Bitcoin is is not around long enough um, to have multiple years of asset pricing, which would make sense going historically before 2016. Because as you go back in time, uh, volatility and and things just become more untrustworthy because um, there wasn't enough uh, money behind it to track. So we start at 2016. We figure that's a good point. That's when all eyes after the um, prior pump, all eyes are on it. Um, now we can see what's going on in in this rally here. Um, Astrius lags behind a little bit, but where Astrius makes its ground and and, and basically gains its, gains its yardage is in the drawdowns. Because once risk off hits, typically Bitcoin will sell off a lot more thereafter, and Astrius will actually have liquidated it, liquidated Bitcoin, go to cash, and wait for the next risk on rally. And you can see that here, where this line is flat, that means Astrius is in cash now. Astrius is only long Bitcoin between uh, uh, from the time from the initial start period of a roughly 2016 to um, 20 to the current time period 20 or is it 30 something percent I think it's like 38 percent of the time in, in the low 30s yeah mid yeah, to it's, low 30s it's, it's cash about two thirds of the time so you're right, not even so, you got you got no headache you're just chilling until till the next rally comes and we get the next risk on that's the beauty of it it's it it really just mitigates drawdowns. That's the main purpose of it. Mitigating drawdowns and catching the waves upwards. Yeah, so that's that's where we'll leave off with Astrius, but it's um it's going to be provided in the daily report and any subscriber you will automatically get access to this. Um and you it'll look the same as Aries showing you the triggers and the stats and you can follow along if you please or how you please or however you want to um use our products. So Let's move on to the topic today. That being the big debate about is this a collateral shortage or is this just price action? Um, a lot of people are very confused, and we're gonna. I, I want to sum this up the most efficiently and um, with the most explanation possible, uh, while not going over too many people's heads. So well, a little, little bit more backstory. You're referring to the spread in the yields between the one month and the three month treasuries. Right. Yes. I'm talking about the three month, one month uh, yield spread, uh, um, basically the spread, right? Like you said, so the three month, one month spread. Now what that's measuring is it's measuring the difference between a three month uh, T-bill and a one month T-bill. Historically, um, outside of 2008, the spread between the one month, uh, the three month, one month and one month T-bills didn't exceed about 60 basis points, as you can see here. Outside of 2008, we pretty much were sub-60 basis points most of the time. Now, 
what is going on right now is a lot of different things, but the main confusion here is a lot of, or at least some high value accounts on Twitter. When I say high value, I mean high following or, or basically famous, right? Semi to, to actually famous accounts are claiming this is a collateral shortage by banks. Now, here's why I don't think that's the case, because it doesn't make much sense if you really think about it. So what's going on in reality? We're seeing credit default swaps hitting um, new all-time highs in terms of, of where they've been, uh, specifically on the one-year um, one durations, basically the next one year, is there going to be a default within the United States government? They're hitting all-time highs going back to 2009, meaning we're above the, the level seen in 2009. Um, that sounds bad. And that's another talking point. Everyone will, will, will point at and say, oh my God, you know, the government's going to implode. Um, but in terms of, it, it's bad within terms of the United States, but it's nowhere near as bad globally. So what the current default swaps are pricing in for the United States is about uh, is a, uh, an implied default of about 1.8%. And I know I'm, over, I'm going over two different things right now. I'm going to tie that into this in a second. But um, the Glo like where, where you really need to be concerned is, again, like I said, within the United States, it looks bad, but globally, it's not because a country that is really um, under pressure will be will be trading in the fives in the in the eight to twelve percent range of um, of def of implied default. So we're well under that range, and I, I think that's why the market hasn't really gotten shocked um, because, again, even though the implied rate is up. Um, it's not, it's nowhere near as, uh, some of these other countries that have seen and are still are struggling with, with economical issues that really bring their ability to default way up there again in the eight to 12% range. And that's where they'll stay, where they'll trade, uh, perpetually. But again, so let's bring that back to this. So default swaps, 1.8% probability of a default. Now, again, we don't. I don't think the market, the, the the United States is going to default, and I don't think the market thinks that. Again, why the market isn't really reacting to this, and what I mean, and when I, I'm, we're going to go over why what I say when the market's reacting. But what am I talking about with the actual default? So there's a difference between a default and a shutdown, right? A shutdown is where the government basically has to cease to cease operations until they can figure out this whole debt situation, and then everything starts back up. Um, no. No treasuries are defaulted on. Nothing is really defaulted on. Um, it does slow growth depending on how long the shutdown um, is underway for, but it doesn't actually default. We don't actually default on our debt, meaning um, coupons get stacked up and paid back in, in terms of whatever, you know, if you go through one or two coupon payments, they're accrued and then they're paid back to you. That's what, what goes on in a default, uh, in a shutdown, excuse me. In a default is a different story. Depending on which issuances and, and, and however the government wants to structure that default, they can basically default on those on those bonds and not pay them back or pay them back partially depending on what the default terms are. And so we obviously don't think, and I the market doesn't think there's a default, but the the odds of a government shutdown are rising. And that's what you're seeing here in the three month to one month spread. What this is telling you, and the reason that we've never seen this happen to this degree before, is the one month yield at least what I can see in here goes back to 2002. Um, I'd have to check the terminal, but I, I don't think it's that. I, I do think it's about this time. It's nowhere near um, as old as some of the other bonds, like the 30-year bonds or the 10-year bonds. So um, the one-month T-bill is rather new in terms of um, historical market pricing, and this is why it's important, because the current federal funds rate is 4.83%, the effective federal funds rate. If we go back in time when we've had these other government scares, these, these shutdowns, because the first thing someone arguing this point will say when you say the reason this spread's exploding is because of the government shutdown, they'll say, okay, go look at 2011, 2013. Um, this spread went nowhere. 2018, um, this spread went nowhere, right? Or the, the 2018 shutdown, the spread went nowhere. Now, again, we're going to bring this back into what those environments were. Interest rates were not at 4.8% at those period at those times. Meaning there was no incentive to hold cash 
as it is today. So everything's magnified. You have to think of everything's basically on steroids right now. You're getting almost 500 basis points today um, for keeping your money in a money market fund. And the number one pri- the, the number one responsibility of a money market fund is going to be liquidity. Okay. So they're gonna they're gonna do everything that they can do, especially on government mandated um money market funds, meaning they they cannot roll their money into the repo market. Well, they can to a certain degree, but they're mandated to hold the next percentage of their assets in government securities, treasuries. Okay. So no matter most, a lot of money market funds are rolling their money up through the re- reverse repo because it's, again, it's, there's no, um, there's no direct, there's no fluctuation. It's, it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed by the fed. Um, there's less risk. There's less risk to ex- a situation that's exactly like this, right? A government default. Um, the the reverse repo would still operate, from my understanding, in a government in a government uh, shutdown, um, and a default. I believe the the Fed still has some runway to operate until um, until they get they they run into some issues. I believe I believe they have enough runway to keep things operational for for some time before things really start falling apart. But let's go back to what's going on here. Interest rates are high, right? Like I said, highest we've seen in, in pretty much since two thousand seven, two thousand eight. So what's gonna what what's happening now is people are in money market funds. It makes sense, right? To to hold money market funds, you're getting five percent risk free interest uh, for doing nothing with your cash. So mon- that's this is an issue that banks are having with deposit flights are going to into these money market funds. So if you're a more money market fund with any government security, um, that being a T bill, most likely, what you're going to do is you're going to mitigate risk of um, mitigate liquidity risk here. Because if the government shuts down and bonds aren't paid back at maturity or, 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 or pretty much, bond, the, not bonds, excuse me, these T-bills wouldn't get paid back um, and there would not be uh, coupon payments. But anything under six months, you're not seeing that coupon payment. Anyways, it just rolled back into uh, one, one, principal, uh, one repayment at the end of at maturity with principal and, and, and interest. So if you have a one-month uh, one month T-bill right now, you're going out to mid-May. And if you have a three-month T-bill, you're going out to mid-July. Well, we know that the that the government debt ceiling is going is is, is approaching fast, and we know that the Treasury is going to run out of money at some point. Or the debt the debt ceiling debate is is in closing fast, right? Like things are things are getting heated, and the and the Treasury is going to run out of money soon. So it's not really a question of when the government has to shut down at this point. Uh, excuse me, it's not, not a question if the government needs to shut down. It's a question of when the government needs to shut down uh, whenever that TGA account gets drained, um, unless the debt ceiling is obviously resolved in between then and everything can function normally. So it's expected we're going to see some issues between June and July, which is why these money market funds or anyone that, that wants to basically sidestep this drama is going to demand one month T-bills because there's no reason in going into any type of liquidity crunch or situation where your your money market fund is ba- or portion of your fund is iced because the government's in a shutdown. So you're going to chase that upfront basically it's it's going to be lower yield because you got volume chasing it now, right? If you have billions of dollars and again, another thing that's been that's been influencing this spread is the issuances have been dropping, meaning the treasury has been issuing less and less um, of these one month T bills over the past few months, because again, the debt ceiling is a the the debate we're, we're running against a debt ceiling now. So they're going to limit issuances until that debt ceiling um, limit is resolved. Again, creating a, a supply constraint for anyone looking to gather short term yields, money market funds, peep, uh, private fund managers, anything like that, uh, family offices and whatnot. So if you got money inside in cash. You'd rather not. You'd rather take the one month and one month from now reevaluate and then just roll it on there for the, um, there forward. If the debt ceiling, maybe the debt ceiling gets resolved, well, then you can go right in to, to the next maturity um, or a longer duration. But if it doesn't, you now have your money back. You could sit back and say, okay, uh, I'm going to wait this one out until it does get resolved. So it's almost a um, you're, you're so just it, burning out. You're, it's you're trying to burn out the a, clock. Just a risk mitigation strategy. Right now, it's you have to understand also in general what this is telling you. This spread, this spread is also telling you the probability of the market expecting Fed 
hikes and cuts. So let's take out this whole period here, and we're going to actually remove the Fed funds rate. Um, let's take out this whole period here pre before it, before we we rip to this these record highs. What you'll notice is this spread will go negative and the spread will go positive. Um, and the volatility of the spread is really determined by what's ex what the market's expecting from the Fed. What do I mean by this? Well, you're measuring the spread between a three-month T-bill and a one-month T-bill. Okay, So the three-month is going to measure three, the, the rate, the expected rate three months out. The one month is going to measure the expected rate one month out, or the real. You can you they're, they're, they are the real rates, not the expected rates, right? So, if the Fed is going to cut rates, there the one month yield, the, the one month T bill, the yield on the one month T bill is not going to accurately represent that Fed rate cut if the Fed is meeting at a point that's greater than one month, or that's greater outside the maturity of the in the following month, meaning. Um, if the Fed is meeting one, one and a half months from now, the one month will not pick up that rate change if it's a rate cut. We'll call it a rate cut. Whereas the three month will pick up that rate cut. So what you'll notice is when you see this plunge negative, what's going on is the market's picking up, um, the market's getting shocked. Because if the market knew about this rate cut, it would be priced in into the one month in the next, in the next month or so, right? If the market doesn't know, you get the shock, meaning the three month the three month picks it up, and the one month pick pick it they both pick it up at an abrupt point. So let let's take um, two thousand eight for example. There was many periods where they thought the Fed was going to cut the Fed, and we'll put the Fed funds rate back on. The Fed did not cut. So you saw these shocks. Basically, what was going on is the three month was. Um, the three month was diving lower in front of the in front of the one month, thinking that at the next meeting the Fed was going to cut at each at, at these meetings. Meanwhile, the Fed didn't do anything, and then we finally got the plunge where the Fed did cut, and the three month had to dive lower because the Fed was it was a surprise rate cut. That's what moves these um, the, the spreads, the surprise rate cuts and rate hikes. And we'll go to 2020 right now. We came into 2022, excuse me, not 2020, 2022. We came into 2022. Expecting very little rate rate hikes. I think that at one point the terminal was only one or two hundred basis points, and um, it really it started off. We we started off expecting one to two rate hikes, then the pause, and then we jumped right into doing fifty basis point rate hikes out of nowhere. And the question really was, where is the Fed going to stop? And we did not know at that point. Terminals kept rising, but what we did know is rates would go up. Now the shock in the rate increases by the Fed were being displayed in this spread, meaning. The reason this was around 50 basis points for a while is the Fed was was constantly hiking 50 basis points aggressively. Again, surprising the markets. The markets were able to adapt at some point, but this type of move, the way they hiked rates, because it was in such a fast pace and such a short duration, you kept surprising the spread because every three months out there was a new 50 basis point rate hike to be priced in. Right, and that's for those of us, for those that have been following us for the past year. That's a different representation of when we were pumping up the terminal rate every every week that we recorded a podcast, the terminal rate was being priced higher and higher. And so this is just another representation of that. Right. And and let's go back to 2019. When this goes or 2018, 2019, when this goes negative, what this is implying is the Fed is going to cut rates. And they did it. They did at one point. That's when we got the lows. Once the and you'll notice the Fed starts cutting rates. Once the market can normalize it, there's no issue. It actually gets closer to zero, as the Fed is expected to hike to, to cut these rates at these meetings. But remember, the three month can only look at three months. So it's not it's if the Fed is expected to cut rates at every meeting in the in the following three months, or I, I should excuse me, if the Fed is expected to cut rates every three months for the next year, this is going to continue to be shocked in a, in a way because. Every three months, there's a new rate cut being pushed into the mark into the three month, right? right? But but right now, you can't really use this as that forecasting tool because we do have that other aspect tied into it now with the the ceiling. So now, right, you, right, right. The, so, this, so that kind of forecasting ability is is now gone 
for now. Well, the reason the reason I bring that up, I, I guess, I, to tie this all together, is there are some takes or some some beliefs that this is a signal that the Fed is going to cut is going to hike rates further, right? Because again, they these people are looking at the one month and they're saying the Fed's going to cut, and they're looking at okay, well, if the Fed's not going to cut. Rates have to go up, or rates gonna are gonna stay up. The market's pricing in that that three months from now, rates will be up now, or at least up from where they are in the one month. Now, the Fed is above the one month, so this is something you also have to pay attention to. If we look at the Fed rate, if we type, if we look at the one month yield, which is right here, and we look at the Fed rate, um, which is this is the Fed. So don't this is the Fed rate. You'll see right here is at four point eight, and let's throw this on the same uh, scale. A. You'll notice the one month has dived well below. We're back to where we were in October of 2022. Meanwhile, the Fed is over 100 basis points higher now in their policy rate. So a lot of people are saying that the Fed is going to pivot because of this. What they're, what they're implying is the Fed is going to have to pivot because the bond market is saying the Fed has to cut rates here with the one month. What they don't do is they don't overlay just, for example, the three month, which, again, is actually showing more rate hikes. Yeah, You, you know what this reminds months. me of? It reminds me of when the oil, the crude oil futures contract went negative. But then you look at the next futures contract behind that, which was perfectly normal. Yeah, that's a great, that's it, a great it's, analogy. It's actually. a very yeah. similar situation. Yeah, because the only reason the, the crude contracts went negative was because no, there was, there was an over, there was basically a supply, a, a supply blast and no one could take delivery of those futures contracts. Right. And now, meanwhile, for, for this, now, in this case, it's the debt ceiling that's messing with the pricing. With the yield, right? Everyone wants the short term. Exactly, everyone wants these these short term uh, bills because they don't want to have to sit through the debt ceiling issue. And long story short, what I'm trying to get at is you can look at this any different way. Like I said, the Fed hiking rates rates are higher than where they are right now. Um, at the excuse me, the three month is higher than the one year uh, than the one month. Excuse me, showing that rates are expected to increase. Um, people are confused by this because they can't. They don't understand when they see one month diving like this. If you look back historically, they, they're very linear. So they say, oh, this is the Fed. This means Fed rate cuts are coming, right? What they don't understand is the context of why this is dropping at this point in time and why the three month is up. Meaning, um, the non consensual view is that the Fed is going to continue hiking rates. Um, and not so much hiking rates, but holding rates higher for longer. Everyone is expecting the Fed to buck trend. That's obviously not the case, uh, at least the way I see it. And I think I want to wrap this up where you can't just look at one data point, if it's this, if it's Bitcoin or whatever it is, or if it's the NASDAQ, and just claim market direction and Fed direction, um, monetary policy direction, without actually understanding the circumstances of what's going on behind that data point. And I think that's what we tried, uh, and I hope we cleared that up today. Um, but again, wrapping this, wrapping this all up, this is not a banking crisis. This is a debt ceiling crisis. That's what this is. If it's a banking crisis, we would see a lot of other issues going down. You think if they if they were if banks were demanding collateral, they would be selling the stock. They would be selling equities. That's the, the risky one of the riskiest first assets they, they can they can unload. They would sell. Why are they not? Why are banks not unloading equities? Why are banks? I mean, I understand banks can't. Banks can only. Banks obviously hold more treasures than anything else. Why are they not unloading high yield? Why are they not unloading these things? Why are they? If we, if we look at high yield, I mean, we could just take a look at the HYG real quick. HYG is chilling. Like this. This is not. This is not bear market. This is not recession. Like, let's take a look. HYG is chilling right now. This does not like. This doesn't look like panic. And I said this about gold, and I'll say this about equities. Um, they, they're one and the same. I think debt ceiling resolution, a resolution to the debt ceiling, is bearish gold and bullish for equities. Because the reason we haven't seen equities propel, and I said this earlier in the podcast, and this is what I'm tying it up with, is that equities aren't running away right now because of this whole government shutdown debt ceiling nonsense. Once that's resolved, what it's going to do. Is it's going to take some? Um, it's going to add more clarity 
and less confusion to the market in terms of where the government the government's spending abilities lie and it'll allow equities to move up i think what's been going on is the debt ceiling is shocking the market in a way of not going down but preventing real progression obviously you can see we're back in the february range and this only holds if we stay bullish trend if bullish trend changes things can change but I think that's where we're going to wrap it up today, guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any questions, reach out to us in our Discord or uh, visit our website, market-radar.com.